If those are all the missing blanks, then thoughts, questions, complaints, Psalm 17. Anything. If not, I got some places we can go, but I'll give you guys first swing. Oh, Kevin Wank in the back. It was interesting when you said uh, that David had an open door in the cave. How do you how do you distinguish? Not all open doors are are from God, right? So no. how do you distinguish that and? I just thought it was interesting because that's happened several times in my life. And, yeah. and I, I think a door is just an opportunity. Um, so Paul can talk about how a, door, a wide open door for ministry is given to him in Macedonia, and yet he didn't take it. So here's this opportunity. David has an opportunity to strike down Saul. He has an open door. I mean, I think that's what we mean by a door, something you can walk through. It doesn't mean necessarily that God wants you to go through it. Um, As Jay Adams has said, sometimes open doors lead to elevator shafts. But it's an opportunity. And then biblically, you've got to size up, what do I do with this opportunity? Um, So sometimes a remarkable opportunity presents itself. But again, that doesn't mean you're to do it. It just means you've got to figure out what to do with it. Um, Were you looking for more than that? No, I just thought it was... Sometimes it's very difficult to know if it's God's leading you like... David right. could have took at that as this is God giving him to me mm. to de- you know take him out, <laughs> but right. he he chose not to. Right. I, well, but but don't miss the text. Go, let's go to let's go to um, let's go to First Samuel twenty four. We with our American um, um, with our American sense of don't tread on me and our live free or die, probably wrestle with David not killing Saul. David's heart smote him. He believes he sinned in cutting Saul's garment. Was David's heart wrong? I don't think so. I think the whole narrative is to show David's righteousness, which means even that act of dishonoring the Lord's anointed was wicked. David's heart smites him. I mean, we're so... We need to do more than simply say, well, okay, I guess David went above and beyond. The text is clear. David's convicted and grieved by this mere act of, that's the Lord's anointed. What are you doing cutting his garment? Who do you think you are? Well, I'm the Lord's anointed also. Yeah, sure, fair enough. Who do you think you are cutting the Lord's anointed's garment? Like the, like our, our measurement of what's fitting and right and appropriate and you know what we think is right and justice needs to be informed by the text. Um, so the men in chapter 24, verse 4 say, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy to your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe, and afterward David's heart struck him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And he said to the men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So this is not a question of, of, of does this opportunity allow him to do it? it? It's such a strange confluence of events. I mean, we, we can imagine as they're hiding in the cave, at first they hear Saul's 3,000 men show up, and they probably think they're done for. Then they hear someone coming into the cave, and, and fear has got to turn to relief when they realize it's just the king seeking some relief. And then David's men whispering to him, now's your chance, go do it. And David initially seems to act upon it. And the second he even cuts the garment of the king, he's convicted of sin. Um, that's the question we, the reader, have to agree is, was David's heart right? I think so. Okay, so what does that mean about honoring our leaders and honoring those God has put over us? Um, you know, so it's it's... It's a remarkable passage. No, the passage, Kevin, makes it clear. This, David's clear. This would be evil for him to do. It would be evil for him to do this. And the Lord Jesus, this is typifying what the Lord Jesus does. <laughs> Jesus is awaiting justice and judgment. He's awaiting vindication. But no one knows the day or the hour but the Father. This is that his Father. When the Father says, now is the time to go judge, Jesus will show up and judge. And Jesus can say, for judgment I came, and would that it were here. In one sense, Jesus is eager 
for vindication. And yet he's content to wait and be patient. And so I, I'm just saying as an American, um, we, we need to adjust our sense of propriety and righteousness by the text. And the text is making it clear just cutting the garment is sin. So do we know where they get this when they said, this is the day the Lord told you? Because if, they're, if the Lord really said, do with them as you see fit, that would shed some light on whether this is wicked or not if, right. if God gave him that leeway. But I don't know of an event that they're speaking of where that was made clear. Yeah, I'm looking to see if they're quoting anything. Um, let me see. No, I got no cross-references, so they think they're just sort of making up, you know. <laughs> like the Lord said, David. Uh, yeah, remember that time? <laughs> yeah. Well, and you can get, if you're with David, you're, you're, you've hitched your wagon to David's wagon. And so, dude, now's your chance. We don't have to run around hiding, being killed. You yeah, can do it. It just seems important to yeah. me because it, it would definitely be hard to call it wicked if the Lord had actually invited him to do as he sees fit. Totally. But, yeah, if that didn't happen, then... No, I have no idea what they're referencing. Like, they say it. <laughs> and I'm not, if anyone's got a study Bible with notes or something, I'm not aware of any antecedent it's text. In first imaginations. Exactly. Um, first imaginations. Don wants to say something. Um, what do you make of then when later when he shows the piece of the garment to Saul and says, Here, I could have killed you? He could have. Uh, yeah. I think the point is simply you're told and believe that I'm a threat to your life. I had it within my power to kill you, and I didn't. Is that not persuasive evidence that I'm not a threat to your life? Right, but we're talking about... But then David was ashamed or, or rude himself for cutting off that piece of the garment. I'm just... No, no, I get it. I'm just dealing with the text. His, cut, his heart struck him. Okay. Now, I need to conclude, is David's conscience informed or uninformed? Am I to view that as right of his heart to, to, to rebuke him or not? So I think in the meta sense, David's really trying to say, look, Saul, I'm not your enemy. Saul, wake up. I love you, and I've only shown loyalty to you. I'm not trying to get you. And to that effect, it works. Saul has a moment of clarity, and you're more righteous than I, and you know, and he calls off the search for a time, but he's out chasing David in short order again. Um, I know I get your point. David does not confess to Saul, I repent of cutting your garment. Um, I'm... Just dealing with the text, though. I don't know why he doesn't do that. What, do you, what, are, you, what are you proposing? Uh, oh. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Just, question, enough. just asking a question. No, no. Fair enough. Fair enough. Any, uh, any further questions along these? Oh, Zach. Sorry to belabor this just a little bit more, but I was trying to think if there's any... Uh, um, what do you call it, like, correlation or connection between him cutting the garment to something that we would do today, since that's not something that probably most of us would do to someone who's our enemy or something. So is, like, the cutting the garment, like, that... That's he, how close he was. But, like, when it's, he says, like, you know, I shouldn't have done that to the Lord's anointed, is it, like, just doing anything that would kind of, like, dishonor or embarrass the Lord's anointed, or is it... I don't know, that he got close, kind of being sneaky. Um, like, what, what was the, do we know, I guess, what was the, the problem with it? And well, I think, it, I think, well, I th- well I, some, something along the lines of, this is the Lord's anointed. What are you doing, sneaking, crouching, hiding up on him, and demonstrating that he's unawares to your being awares? There's a sense of shame, like, I was that close to you. It, that, that, I, that, I mean, Saul's going to feel chagrin. He's going in to seek privacy to go relieve himself. And David said, let me, let me put it this way. If, if you were going into the restroom to relieve yourself and somebody were sneaking up on you, would you not feel a sense of violation and, hey, what on earth? Like, would you not feel some sense of wrong? Now, if, if they're doing it because they may or may not kill you, does that add to it? I mean, I think it's fair enough to get how there's a dishonoring and who do you think you are. Or to flip it around, if, if one of my kids was sneaking in to the bathroom to, like, play a trick on me while I was going to the bathroom, there'd be a problem. 
I would point. feel I would feel dishonored. You know. Yep. Um, so I, I think clearly in the sense of of to honor Saul. Now, I'm not sure what David was thinking because he cuts the garment, then his heart strikes him. So I don't know if cutting the garment was a precursor to killing Saul or not, or if he'd already decided he wasn't going to kill him, or if he was. I, I don't. The, so the flow of the narrative is is as Don brings up interesting because. The flow is his men sight first imaginations. Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you, which doesn't have any antecedent that I'm aware of. So David acts upon it. Then David arose. So they say this, and David's response is to go do stuff. He comes back and says, No, 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 no. So, so he seems to some measure to be sold on some course of action close to what they're saying. David arose stealthily, cut off a corner of Saul's garment. Um, And afterward, David's heart struck him. And then he returns, and he says to the man, no, 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 we can't do this, guys. So I don't know in his head what he was thinking, why, if you're going to assassinate someone, you first cut a piece of their robe. I I don't know why. Because it would make more sense if his heart struck him, and then he cut the robe. Okay, I'm not going to kill him, I'll take a piece of his robe. But he takes the robe, then he gets convicted, then he comes back, then he tells his man, no, 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 no. So I'll, I'll look at this some more, and oh, Serena's got the answer. Oh, and she got more questions. Okay. Two questions. Yeah. One is: Is this before or after the spear in the water jug incident? And how does that relate? So and the other one is in twenty six. That's okay. before twenty six is the other one. The other event similar. Um, if you guys want to turn there. Um, uh, then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakila, which is on the east of Jeshimon? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hakila, which is beside the road of the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. And then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of the army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped about him. Then David said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Joab's brother, Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, who will go down with me into the camp of Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai went to their army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his great spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I shall not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down in battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Now, take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head. They went away. No man knew it or no man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake. And they were all asleep because of a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Then David went over to another side of that stood far off the top stood far off on the top of the hill, with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? Then Abner said, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your Lord the king? For all the people came in to destroy for one of the people came in to destroy the king your Lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my Lord, O King. And he said, Why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on your hands? Now therefore, let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. 
If it is the Lord who has stirred you against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. Wait, let me read that again. I'm, that seemed off. Um, may they be cursed. For they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth, away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is the spear, O king. Let one of your men come and take it away. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me out of all tribulation. And then Saul said to David, Bless you, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things, and you will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. David didn't exactly trust the invitation to come in, though. <laughs> Um, so, Serena, that's that's the other account. Did you? That, that, so, twenty four is before twenty six. So he's he in twenty four. He says he hasn't sinned to Saul. Mm. So could it be that the sin was in his motive in his heart, and he didn't feel the need to confess that to Saul that there wasn't anything inherently wrong with cutting the robe? It's, it's possible. We we don't. It, the text doesn't say his heart smote him because he cut the garment. The ordering is his men say go kill him. You've had an opportunity. He gets up. He goes. He cuts. When he'd cut, his heart smote him. So his heart could be smiting if what he intended to do next is possible. Because um, he doesn't seem to feel any sin about taking the spear no, and water that's, 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 that's possible as well. It is a strange passage to try to get the, the specifics. Nope, Eric's got it. And then Don. So in the ancient world... Remember when the Pharisees would get mad and they'd tear their robes and all this stuff? Could it be that the value of the robe is a whole lot heightened in this culture? Oh, certainly. As opposed to just just Jesus teaching, teaching right? right? You don't take a man's inner garment. Like you just take 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 um, Samson. He bet each man a wardrobe of clothes, which really is just a robe. Like right. you had maybe a robe, maybe a second robe, maybe if you were wealthy. You're your robe, ro- their clothing is certainly more valuable to them, and they had less than we have clothes. I don't know if it's just the value of it that's the thing, though. Um, it's just the corner of the robe, and the king can, if anyone can have multiple robes, it's the king. So I, I, but culturally, you would be you would be brought up take care of your robe, take care of your one, like the entire culture would understand that. Even though the king has many, right. it doesn't make them... Well, no, in the, law, in the law of Moses, if a day labor, if somebody gives you their cloak for surety, you give it back from them by night because that's what they sleep in. The, the law is assuming you have one set of clothes, which is also your bed clothes. And you have underclothes. You have, a, you have an ephod that you can change. So the notion is you'd have undergarments that would get soiled and changed, but your outer garments you just wear. Um, and so, yeah, it, Chris is going to jump in. So when I read this, it Mm. looks to me like you would never do this to the king in front of his face. Like if if he's sitting there looking at you, you're not going to cut a piece of his robe off. There's a certain amount of affront Mm. that who are you to do this to me? Yeah. You know, um, it'd be a rough thing to do to anybody uh, openly, let alone the king who's supposed to be revered and protected. But I'm wondering if the the strangeness of the timing, it sounds like he saw the wisdom up front of doing what he eventually did and uh, showing I'm not a threat by just cutting the robe. Mm. But once he had cut it and the adrenaline to do that took place, now he's got the next step of showing him. Mm. And I could imagine the sobering effect. Mm. I'm about to tell the king that I just cut his robe, and I hope he understands what I'm trying to do here. Boo. But, right, right. <laughs> okay, maybe. Like, all of a sudden, the, the weight of what he just did would probably set in a lot heavier than the 
you know, his men hyping him up and like, this is your chance. This is your chance. Yeah, that's a good idea. Mm. Then once you're ready to talk to him, it's like, oh man, what did I just do? It, no, it, it it could be. It could be. We the text doesn't say what his heart struck him for. It just gets the order. He he cut his garment, afterwards his heart struck him, then he returned and said X. And as has been pointed out, he doesn't apologize for cutting the garment. So I'm, I may have spoken too hastily with saying it's absolutely wrong. It's oh, who's who's going next? Dean, Dean's got it. As you were mentioning uh, Daniel and his trusting in God to deliver him or not, yeah, it struck me that what what do you think of the the different reaction between Daniel and David fleeing? They both could have fled the king's court, but Daniel chose not to flee and take whatever where David yeah. fled. No. Is, is that considered uh, distrusting of God to protect him? I don't think so. Um, I think part of the thing is if you're in the capital city of Babylon, I mean, we, the, the notion that, that citizens might have the power to resist a potentate it's just not even a question whether or not you can escape Nebuchadnezzar. The assumptions, of course, if Nebuchadnezzar wants you arrested, you're getting arrested. Of course, if and with David, with where he lives in the city, and yeah, not David, Daniel, sorry, Daniel, um, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as well. But there's also something clear with David that he's making a point. He lets his windows open. David, wait, Daniel, <laughs> Daniel had opportunities to simply hide his rebellion. And he doesn't do that. So I think part of what Daniel's doing is no, and I don't want anyone to think I'm afraid and that I'm going to bend the knee. And so no, and he opens his windows, and then he doesn't flee. Um, I mean, and church history is, is littered with people who do both. Um, Polycarp lets himself get arrested, and they try to feed him the animals. And if you trust Fox's Book of Martyrs, the animals wouldn't touch him. And <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. It's a remarkable story. He's martyred him. And yet Saul gets let out a window in a basket in Acts. So fleeing, and Jesus even saying, flee to the mountains in that day. So I don't know, I don't have a clear line of when you stay and boldly face the music and when you flee, but clearly flight is permissible. I mean, Jesus explicitly says, flee to, let me look it up, flee to the mountains. He's talking about a coming tribulation. Oh, yeah. They tried to lay hands on him, but he disappeared or he left their midst. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know. David is not rebuked for fleeing from Saul um, at all. So it might be, I, it might be that, um, it might be that Daniel has no opportunity, no realistic opportunity to flee. He's so, he's a pretty high up dignitary and official. I, it might be that he has no possibility of getting out unnoticed, or it just might be that he's willing to take whatever happens, happens. Um, there are examples of that, but flight seems a completely valid thing. Um, anyone want to weigh in on when flying, fleeing, flying, <laughs> flying? Um, oh, wow. I'm, Matthew 24, 15. Matthew 24, 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in the house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that the flight may not be in winter on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now and no, never will be. So yeah, Jesus, there's at least one scenario where run, get out of here, flee, is the order of the day. So it, it's, it's a fair point. I don't, I don't know why Daniel sticks around. i got some ideas, but yeah. Any other? Well, I'm just thinking uh, on the going back to the cut yeah. robe and the fact that he stealthily came in. So Saul may not have been even aware that he had cut it at all. Right. And by him having that piece of cloth in his hand provided the contrast and for his ability to say, yeah. see how close I was to you. 
but I did not take your life. No, no, that, I think that's exactly the point. So you go, in, you, go in the, you go in the cave, you either take the robe off or you push it off from you so you don't get your bodily fluids on it. Um, and then you put it back on, and yeah, it would be entirely reasonable to think someone didn't notice there's a corner of the, of the cloth missing. But, you know, David holds it up and, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. No, so Chris's suggestion that perhaps David was even thinking of saying, hey there, boo, or I don't know. Um, somewhere in what David is thinking, his heart strikes him, and it's after he cut the garment. So, yeah. Oh, okay, Don. We're getting off on this garment there. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Thankfully, there wasn't a boat in the text. You guys remember Boat Gate? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, Don. Um, about uh, Dean uh, talking about uh, fleeing, where Jesus himself escaped uh, in Luke 4. From, they, they were going to kill him, throw him off a cliff. Yeah. And he evaded them yeah. in, a, in a mysterious way, but yeah. it wasn't his time yet. Right. Well, and, and like, for instance, even the book of Acts, they sent them to arrest uh, Peter and John, and there were so many people that the soldiers sent to arrest them were scared. They could have said, we ain't going with you. And I'm not sure why they didn't, but they went with them and were flogged and released. But we know there are instances where they, without using any force, could have just said, nah, and so going through when people decide to just, okay, sure. And when they decide to hide, when they let Saul down a basket out of the window, I don't, I don't have a clear-cut set of rules of engagement along those lines. Um, but, but the one thing we don't see, and I, and I know this is the, the hotbed question, is when is it okay to fight back? There's very little, if any, precedent for that, which means you've got to think through that pretty carefully. Fleeing and avoiding is different than fighting. I think you could make, you certainly can make an example from Esther, right? So, like, how does, how does God deliver the Jews in Esther? They get permission to defend themselves. Remarkable. The Lord's deliverance in Esther is okay, you, you guys can defend yourselves, which is interesting in and of itself. So, there's differing stages. You put up with it, you submit to it, you flee. And you can obviously at times fight back. David will not fight back against Saul, at least not directly against Saul. He will not do that. So the, there's different math equations for different levels, and thinking through what's right, what's fitting can be, can be tough. So um, I'm not trying to do all the math right now. Oh, Lee. Oh, dear. Lee. Oh, Don, you have a mic. Don, your question while, while they get the mic to Lee. Well, I'll just admit, a comment that uh, Paul... Used the legal system of his day yeah, yeah. to make it, you know, yeah. in his own defense. Yeah, you know, he, he, he didn't. He fought a legal battle. He didn't fight a physical battle, but right, uh, he lost. Right. Oh no, and I and I think in our day, if God's given us courts to appeal to judges, I mean, if you want to say in effect to something you think's illegal, I'd I'd like to call on a judge to render a verdict because I don't think this is right. I think I think you're not keeping your own rules. By by all means, Paul certainly does that. Absolutely. Yeah, Lee. Yeah, it's interesting uh, about fighting back because I was listening to this guy and he was talking about the history of Europe and about when the uh, Muslims invaded Europe in the, I don't know, 1300s, 1200s, yeah. whenever it was, went through Spain, went up through Europe, got to the gates of Vienna. Oh, yeah. And the, and the, Suleiman, there's, right? There's, yeah, there, yeah. I'm not sure who, but they're fighting the whole way like it's a war. And these yeah. they're there to conquer the Christians right. and kill them, do whatever they want to do with them. And so now... It was interesting because he was saying today this is our culture is so different that we're saying, yes, come in. We don't want to fight. Well, let's all get along. And it's not working so great, especially in Britain. You see some of the crazy things going on. So I don't know because, yeah. I mean, that's a war. Like where, yeah, the, the when to fight back is such a weird puzzle. And, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, no, European history is amazing. Yes, yeah, Suleiman. It was Suleiman the Magnificent. He got to the gates of Vienna, and that actually... We're, my, I'm in a men's Bible study. We're going through a book on church history. And interestingly, that's what gave Luther cover, because the Holy Roman Emperor was 
set to stomp out the heresy of Protestantism. And then as Suleiman approaches, he needs a unified Germany to raise armies to go fight. So basically, in the Kamik set aside our differences to go fight the, the Turks, and that buys some more time. So it's interesting, even God's sovereignty, how that stuff worked out. Um, you know, they, they got right, that, that shook them to their core when they got to Vienna. That, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it's one thing for it to be down in, in northern Africa and Asia, but forget that close into Western Europe or close to Western Europe is pretty pretty big deal. Chris? So I was just thinking about the when to flee, when not to flee question, and I this isn't to be dogmatic about oh, yeah. anything, but just an observation. So we see Paul flee, we see David flee, we see Jesus, you could say, flee in certain scenarios. But avoid you, avoid apprehension. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you also see Paul contend Philemon fleeing yeah. and uh, recommend that he go back to his master. And I, it makes me think, I wonder if a consideration in this is how much authority the person rightfully has over you. Right. If that's, if anyone who's fleeing, David was anointed as King right. at the time. So he was not under Saul's authority. You're not the King Saul. Right. Right. So, so he had the right, right. to do what he wanted. Yeah. Jesus obviously is not under any earthly reign. Mm. Um, so he could do what he wanted. Paul, but it's but the people. Jesus submits to the political rulers. Sure. But, it's, mobs, uh, it's mobs Jesus avoids. Right. And I think the same thing in Paul's case, that when he's fleeing, it's not a lawful justice system right. that's coming with right. a grievance. It's mob rule coming right. with violence, that kind right. of thing. Right. So I'm wondering if that's, that's kind of the rule of thumb we should be observing. Is well, I think, I, I got to test it out, but I think, that's what I tend to think. I tend to think, um, well, I know, God has given the state the power of the sword. The state can lawfully kill. The state can lawfully make war, Lee. Um, and the question then is, obviously the state can misuse its power, but it's, it, I tend to think it's its power to misuse. So it's like, okay, God's given you the power to put me to death, I think it'd be wicked for you to do it, but it's your call, not mine. You do have the discretion. Right. Yeah. That tends to be what I, yeah, yeah. this and tends to be what it looks like, yeah. And it's informative that even though Daniel was a prisoner against his will, um, he was still under the authority of that yeah. reign. Yeah. We would look at that and say, oh, but you didn't choose them as your governor or whatever. Well, he was kidnapped and castrated. Exactly. So, but under maybe Romans 13, maybe he is considered under that authority. Well, he, he certainly becomes a... No, I'd say more than that. By virtue of his position, he has adopted... He's helping strengthen Nebuchadnezzar's regime. I mean, this is also part of the problem. People want to think through the ethics of... Uh, D- Daniel, nowhere in the book of Daniel, confesses any sin. Nowhere is Daniel ever spoken of negatively. And yet there's no doubt Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was more powerful, more prosperous, more efficient, and more able to accomplish Nebuchadnezzar's will. Because it, Daniel survives three regimes. You are a pretty good advisor when you survive three regimes. He survives Nebuchadnezzar, he survives his son, and he lives to Darius. Um, and so all three of these guys view Daniel as very helpful, even though he's a pagan, I mean, from their point of view, even though he's a foreigner with odd customs. So there's no question the Babylonian Empire is stronger due to Daniel's help. And yet, and we know that Nebuchadnezzar did some great evil. He was a, ter- I mean, he was a tyrant. I mean, you read about what he does to the last king of Israel. It's brutal. He t- puts out his own eyes with his own fingers after he makes him watch him kill his sons. So the last thing, I think it's Jehoiachin, the last thing Jehoiachin sees before Nebuchadnezzar personally puts out his eyes is his, his own line come to an end. And then he takes him away to Babylon. Um, And uh, so Nebuchadnezzar, prior to his conversion, is a brutal man. David's clearly working. So he's part of that system. So I'd say by virtue of being part of that system, David himself is recognizing the legitimacy of that system. Yeah, so absolutely David's under Nebuchadnezzar's authority. And Daniel, good night. Good night. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Now, these, admittedly, these things are not easy. Nathan. Oh, 
sorry, yes, Annalisa, you first. So I was going to go a different direction than where we were. By all means. Um, so under here and answer me, I loved that you reminded us that David remembered the wonders that God has done. And when we do that, then we have more confidence and faith. It bolsters. Mm. And it, it wasn't just that it was for David's sake. It was also, God, I know that you are this God who can do that. Yeah. Amen. Well, I think, I think, hold on one second. I think it's key to how we ask. The disciples wake Jesus up in the boat, and they, and they even say, don't you care? There's a sense of like, do you see what's going on? What are you, what are you doing? Don't, don't you care? David, as much as he's saying, help, pay attention, listen, wake up, is also confident that when God does see and pay attention, he's going to act. And so he's calling on, there's not the slightest suggestion, why don't you care? Why are you so calloused? He's calling on a God to help who he believes helps and reminds himself has done exactly that. And you're going to call on a God differently when you have that in mind. Nathan. I was just thinking as a summation to like uh, to circle back to fleeing or staying like this is where like this is why as Christians we're called to walk in the spirit and to be guided by uh, his truth and what he places in our hearts through the word of God and through the body of Christ, because that's going to kind of play a lot into yeah. some of those guidelines. And so instead of the focus being, should I flee or should I go, the the focus should be more on what would Christ have for me. And right. as we search the scriptures and if we don't get any clear answer, we know that he will guide us and he will lead us. And yeah. through his sovereign control, his plan and his purposes will keep moving forward. Yeah. I, I mean, as a thought experiment, I've, 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 I could make a case, I think. So if you're living, if you're a Christian living in Poland, the beginning of World War II and the Blitzkrieg, I think there's two responses that could be undertaken by two different people in faith that are diametrically opposite. I could think one person might say, my, my loyalty is with the underground Polish government. Um, these people are, are wicked. These people are invaders. And I'm going to work with the underground government to try to fight back. I think that could be done in faith. And I think someone else might say, much like Israel was given into the hands of Babylon, God has given us into the hands of these wicked people. And just as Israel and Babylon, we should try to make peace and serve our wicked masters as well as we can, and God has judged us. And I think both responses could be done in faith. Um, I, I, I'm not sure there's a right answer. Um, and ultimately what God calls on us to do is to act in faith and in love. And so I, I don't know if we've got... We don't necessarily have a rule set for every single contingency. I mean, even in Israel's Old Testament law, you have a combination of case law and judges. So the law of Moses does not cover every contingency. It covers a lot of contingencies. And then for the rest, appoint wise men, right? Um, and so for some of these things, we just need wisdom. Lord, if, we are, if you're living in Poland during the Blitzkrieg, you're going to need some wisdom to know what to do. <laughs> And, and I trust God will give it to you if you seek it. Like, that's your point. Is like rather than ahead of time knowing every rule. And it, no, it's good. If God gave us a rule, we should know it. But there doesn't seem to be a clear rule. When do you flee? When do you stand? Okay, then give me wisdom to know the right thing to do um, in that time. Amen. Amen. Okay, six minutes on the clock. Anybody? Oh. Mr. Kleinfelter. So prior to the incident with the robe in chapter 24, is there a time where David makes it clear that he will do no harm to Saul? Because it seems his men say, now is your opportunity to take his life. And then David arose to cut off his robe. And I wonder if he hadn't fully fleshed out his position because after that his heart strikes him and the difference between chapter 26 mm. when the opportunity is there he is abundantly clear when he said when his the man with him says let me take his life his immediate response is no and he lists out you know all those reasons so i wonder if part of what you see with david's heart striking him is him not even knowing that he had decided whether or not he mm. would take saul's life if he had the opportunity that's a good question i do not know I'll have to look into that. There's a small group that's been going through First and Second Samuel. Anyone part of that small group know the answer to that? Or I'll look it up. You may have a good point. This may be the point where David's crystallized. No. Because in 19, I know he has four escapes from Saul. 
but I, it may well be that 24 is the first place where he actually has the power to do something. And he hasn't even entered. Like, like part of what we have to wrestle with, as I was saying, is the notion that you can stand it to a government is a relatively modern thing with modern weapons. You, you don't start a revolt against a king and his army. You just don't because you lose. Um, and so David's fleeing, fleeing, fleeing. And in 24 may well be the first time he has something he can actually do about it. That's an interesting question. Uh, interesting thought. I will, I'll attempt to get back next week on whether that holds up. I think it may well hold up. That's a good thought. Anything else? Anybody? Five minutes. Well, we don't necessarily have time to go to Romans 12. Let me see. Um, Anything else? All right. Oh, you got one, Timothy. I was going to let you guys go early, but okay. Timothy. Oh, great. Now I'm the bad guy. <laughs> Thanks, Timothy. Go in peace. Okay, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this is, this is big philosophical, and it's not unique to this passage, but I've, life is important, right? Yeah. But eternal life is more important, right? Yes. So why... Uh, again, this is, this is sort of weird. I wasn't going to ask because I'm not sure I have it f- fully formulated. But like, as Christians, why is it that this life is still important? Why is it that David wants to be kept safe, um, or you know that any of us like should value this life? We clearly should, right? But yeah. I guess just speak to that um, maybe because that may it comes up in the Psalms quite a bit, oh, yeah. you know. Will the um, dust praise you? That's what David says and I think, Psalm 6. Um, what? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so I, yeah, I mean, yeah. Don't, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that I don't believe that, but it, it just, it's, it's a constant theme, right, that we're, and Paul uh, could have at any time quit trying to survive the shipwrecks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and just been like, you know, I'll just give up and go to heaven, but we're, Regularly called to endure and yeah. to and and ask for our lives to be good and fruitful and safe. My with the clock with three minutes on the clock. My three minute answer is: it seems as though the primary stage where God intends to display His glory is the stage of human history in this planet on this earth. The the significant events: the fall happens here, the atonement happens here, the judgment of His enemies happens here, um, and so. That there is work to be done here. God's purpose is to be fulfilled. So Paul says to the Philippians, I wish to depart and be, be with the Lord, for that is far better, but to remain here is more urgent for your account. David is in a particular place. He knows he's the anointed king of God's people, which means there's work for him to do. Um, and so those, I think, are right ways to view that. As, as, as a husband and father, there's work that God would have me do, and those are right reasons to want to stay um, and, and to be here, that tension should be present. There's also work to be done in winning the lost. So Paul, who Paul says he wants to win the more, he he wants to be the one personally who brings more of them in. God is doing this great redemption and rescue plan, and you can take part in it. And you you can take part in it more or less. And Paul wants to be taking part in it more. So I think thinking along those lines, there's plenty of reasons to want to stay here. Now, if the reason you want to stay here is because you haven't been to Disneyland yet. That sounds like, the, no, it was so haunting, those, those last few verses of Psalm 17. They're, they're, they're satisfied with kids and, and with giving their things to babies. Like, Saul is the king, and as far as it goes, he's got the most, and it's still really sad. And we can sit back and look and just like, poor Saul. I mean, as much as Saul brings it upon himself, and he's wicked, and his end is his own doing, there's a tragedy to it of this guy who's just obsessed with giving his kid the throne, and that's that's as big as that's the biggest good he can hope for, and it so pales in comparison. So if we want to stay here for those reasons, we need to watch out. The danger would be why we want to stay here, and some people might just want to go and be with the Lord. Well, to that I'd say there's there's a reason he's got you here. What work? What good things is he having you here to do? And see the value of that. Um, he, he's to use this. I know this is ill advised using a sports analogy. But he's he's got you in running a play. Like, what's your part in the play? I wish I was on the bench. 
but he put you in for this play. So what's your part? Well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not catching the ball. Okay, well, then pro- provide cover, whatever you're supposed to be doing. Run the play. Or to use another analogy N.D. Wilson uses, you, know, you get another scene on the stage. So do the scene well. You know? um, God has determined that you're, you're part of the cast of this scene. Act it out well. Do your part well. Those are good reasons to say. So I, I, think, I think both can be present. The Christian can so love this world... Because Demas, why does Demas forsake Paul? In love with this world. So there's a love for this world we are not to have. And, and there's a balancing act, right? Because um, Paul describes these people in Psalm 17 like, as you fill their, ESV says their womb, it's really their belly, with good things. And Paul knows of people whose God is their belly, who this, their appetites in this world is all they have, and yet Paul can also say in First Timothy, tell the rich of this world not to put their host and certainty of riches, but God has given us all things freely to enjoy. So there's nothing wrong with enjoying the creation. Just don't be the people that's, that's your God. Um, there's, a, there's a balancing act between aestheticism and hedonism that we need to strike. <laughs> At, Well, later, David's going to put to death the guy who falsely claims to have killed Saul. And he's going to say, by your own mouth, you've, you've condemned yourself. Kill him. But you said you've struck down the Lord's anointed. And, that's, and, that's, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying there's never a place to fight back. I think those are really complicated issues. What I would say is, when it's, it needs to be a weighty and heavy. Whatever it is, it's not a light thing. If it is time to strike down the Lord's servant, which is what Paul calls Caesar in Romans 13, let it be a weighty, somber, and serious thing and not a mess with the bull, get the horns, don't tread on me type of vibe. Whatever it is, it ain't that. Whatever it is, it's a weighty thing. And it may be a much weightier thing than we would ever dream to think. Um, at the very least, we get that from, from David. I don't think the Lord's going to rebuke you for taking his authorities that he's placed in your life as too great of a thing. I, I doubt that's going to be a rebuke we're going to get in the Day of Judgment. Like, you gave him too much honor. Doubt it. Anyway, with that, God fleed, God speed, God bless, and good day.